Okay, so we're in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 in the Passion uh, Translation. And uh, like I said, we'll see how far we get today. Uh, I'm going to have my other Bible open to our John verse, one of my favorites, John 1, 1 through 3, that we'll look at in a second. But in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For he now towers above all creation, for all things exist through him and for him, and that God made him pioneer of our salvation, perfect through his sufferings. For this is how he brings many sons and daughters to share in his glory. So his perfection through his sufferings is how we become sons and daughters, okay? And we'll break that down because he was already perfect. So what does it mean perfect through his suffering? So we'll, we'll need to dive into that. So I love the phrase, he towers above all creation. And that's because all things exist through him and for him. And John 1, 1 uh, through 3 makes it very, very plain. But uh, Paul is affirming, reaffirming again, that Jesus is God. God became man in Jesus Christ for our behalf. So all things exist through and for him. And if you really want to dive into that, Colossians is all about that. Colossians really, uh, to me, is one of the best epistles Paul wrote concerning the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So it's a, it's a great one. In fact, that was the one where Margie was able to cry again, is right in the middle of us doing that uh, with no tear ducts. And uh, so it's a really good epistle. But here in uh, John 1, 1 through 3, I want to read this real quick from the English Standard Bible. And it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, that's what establishes Him as the one true God. Remember, we talked last week about the government of angels and how there is a divine council in heaven over which God, Elohim, presides over the Elohim, plural. And so they're called gods in Psalm 82, Deuteronomy 32, and I also believe uh, chapter 28, possibly. And so he, as the one God who has existed always, has not been made or created, is over all of creation, which includes angels, which is more a function than an actual type of being, but all, over all the divine family of God and also over all of us, the earthly family of God. And uh, the book Lucifer by, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, oh gosh, what was her name? Uh, they started God TV. Ah, Alec, maybe. Anyway, she wrote a book about what how she feels the fall occurred of Lucifer, and I agree with her based on our study of uh, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 that Lucifer was not fallen until after the creation of man. And if I, you guys were here during that study, we went into the wealth and why he fell and things like that, that there had to be wealth occurring in the Garden of Eden the exchange, because it says you were in the Garden of Eden and iniquity was found in you because you desired the wealth. You know, so we went into all of that. So if that, if we believe the, the account in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, then that tells us he fell after. Well, in her book, uh, her hypothesis is that he fell because why would God need man when he has them? Why would God create a whole family of beings when he has the angels? And so jealousy entered the heart. Envy entered his heart. And he's like, well, that's fine. I'll just become God. See, so whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. You can read a lot into it. But I do. we do know that he became envious. We also know that he was working through the Pharisees because they killed Jesus Christ because of envy. See, that's in the book of Acts. So anyway... The, the uh, point of that is, I have no idea. <laughs> and no one else does either. Yeah. It's a fun point, though. 
But, uh, oh, the Council of the Gods. So anyway, with the fall, uh, we have this situation where the gods that he put, he gave the nations over to them, and he took Israel to himself, see? And so Israel became very important to him as a nation, and even they betrayed him. And so his testimony is that in us, He's going to have a people that remain true. And so I still can't figure out why he decided all of us to be born in this time. Because there's going to be people born post-Jesus, you know. And so the fact that we got to be born in this time is just incredible. So anyway, we'll get our resurrected bodies and never be subject to temptation again. Now, as God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit executed the audacious plan for God to become man and rescue us, so the Father made Jesus the pioneer of our salvation so that he could bring many sons and daughters to glory. So he's restoring the glory that was lost in the garden. That's why Paul wrote in uh, Romans 3.23 that all have sinned or missed the mark, fallen short of the glory. So that's important because religion... Um, reduces the work of salvation to righteousness and escaping hell. But the work of salvation is the first step to restoration of the glory of God in man and the expansion of the kingdom. So if people think of salvation as a ticket out of hell only, then that's their focus and that they will live actually way below what they're called to do. But if the Christian understands, okay, I am now a new creation, I'm a new race. There's never been a race like us until Jesus Christ. When the Christian gets that, it begs the question, why? Like, why doesn't he just handle it all right now? You know what I mean? Because that's not been his goal. His end game is not necessarily salvation. His end game is he has put a target on the enemy's back, on all the gods that betrayed him and his divine counsel, and on the Nephilim situation. He's put a target on it, and the way he's going to execute his plan against their plan is through us. Okay? So that's a recap, right, from last week. Drea, you look confused. Are you confused? Or are we good? Okay. <laughs> so God, in complete agreement and glory, decided that it was fitting to become a man, and the author of our salvation. So the word fitting means to be eminent, distinguished, and to excel. In other words, out of all the plans he may have strategized, there was only one that excelled, and that was him becoming man. Why? It was a legal decision. God could not rescue us any other way because that would have been illegal because he gave authority to man. He gave the earth to man. Man gave it over to the devil. So the only way to get it back was for God to forever change his form and become one of us. So even though Jesus existed pre-body and he exists post-body, now in his post-body uh, form, he will always be a man resurrected. Where before he didn't have a body. For us, that's what's astounding to me. Mm -hmm. I love the the in the passion instead of the they call it instead of the word. You know, in the beginning was the word. Mm -hmm. it, it's called the living expression. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, in and logos, the says, word there mm -hmm. is divine expression. Right. If you want to know what Father's thinking, He expressed it through Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and Jesus Christ said, "If you see Me, you see Him." And so it's very important to make sure we're viewing the Father correctly because Jesus is His expression. Like, for example, He said, I, I didn't come to, to uh, destroy, I came to save. You know, and so that should be our philosophy. But on the other hand, He's also a lion. You know, so there's uh, all kinds of expressions that we have to make sure that we have, not what religion tells us. In the New Testament, this word is often used as something that is becoming or proper. In other words, it's beautiful, like your dream. That's kind of interesting. So becoming means suitable, proper, and appropriate. 
it has the implication of possible moral judgment involved, implying that the only fitting way to rescue us was by God becoming man because he gave man earth. Therefore, the only moral thing to do is to become one of us and take it back. So God will, he won't go against his word. He's exalted his word. Uh, and then Jesus is the word who became man. So he will not go against that. But I also can't help but think that he saw our inability to save ourselves. You know, there was no way. There was no way we could save ourselves at all. And so if he wouldn't have done that, we would be absolutely lost forever. And the, the reality is we didn't choose that. Adam and Eve chose that. And I think that's important for people to know. We were born into sin without choice, right? Because the bloodline was tainted. I didn't ask to be born into a, a tainted bloodline and to be a sinner and to hate God and to uh, drink and do drugs before I got born again. And he knew that. He also knew the exact way to get my attention to wake me up, right? So for all of us, our salvation story is very personal. And so then from that point on, he begins his transformation. And really the transformation is in your soul coming into agreement with what he has done in you. That way you can then do the same thing and reproduce, multiply. And so... Uh, he recognized our inability uh, to save ourselves. We didn't choose to be sinners. Adam and Eve chose that for us. So he uh, became our answer. Now the word pioneer can also mean author or founder. It's from the Greek word arche, A-R-C-H-E. And it means beginning or rule. And then there's also uh, A-G-O, which is uh, the rest of the word which means to lead. So he's the originator, the founder, the leader, chief, first, and prince, as distinguished from simply being the cause. Because just because someone is a cause doesn't mean they're the beginning. Okay? And so for us, he is the beginning or the originator of God's creation, both with Adam and Eve and now. And the mandate's the same. Go out and multiply. Fill the earth. Take dominion. So it's, it's the same thing, right? He's, he's very focused. God is very one track in his plan. So he is the beginning or the originator of God's creation, and this excludes him from himself being a product of that beginning. In other words, all things exist in and through him. In other words, he's the origin. He's the source. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end of which we have our beginning. Okay? So Jesus is the originator, the founder, the leaf, leaf, leader, the chief, the first, the prince, and the pioneer of salvation, a reality that did not exist before him. No one could go to heaven before Jesus Christ because sin was still present. Even though they lived in paradise, their sin was still there. Once he died and was resurrected, all the sin Jeremiah might have committed, all the sin Isaiah committed, all the sin David, and we know David committed, all of that sin was erased. Then the graves opened, right? Yeah. And they came out. Why did they want to be buried there? Why did, why did Abraham buy that lot? Why did Joseph say, make sure you take my bones out with you? Jacob, make sure you take me out with you. Why do they want that? Because they knew by revelation that the Messiah was going to be there. They wanted to be there and they wanted to be resurrected with them. Which makes the fact that the Pharisees refused to see that Jesus Christ was the Messiah even more egregious. Because... The true prophets, Abraham was a prophet, Joseph was a prophet, Jacob was a prophet, David was a prophet. They saw the suffering Messiah. I mean, David wrote about it all in his Psalms. They saw it. Abraham walked it out with his son, right? Mm -hmm. Taking him to be killed. And then he said, oh, I have provided for myself, God said. I have provided for myself a lamb. 
So they all knew the Messiah would suffer. Daniel wrote the Messiah would be cut off. That word cut off means to be, uh, to basically die a criminal's uh, execution. Okay? So they all knew it. So the Pharisees, when he was there, he had the genealogy. He was healing the blind eyes, right? That was a Messiah miracle. No one had ever done that before. All the evidence was there, and they refused to believe. See, there's an unbelief that is different from that type of unbelief. They refused to believe, and that's why Ananias was filleted alive. Uh, the other one, Caiaphas, was also murdered, uh, killed. I think he was crucified upside down because how they handled Jesus Christ. So yes, he is the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, but he's also the lion that will execute judgment against his enemies. So it's very important to understand these things because he's not here just to save us. He is here to take over. So once he was, uh, his blood was shed, their sins were forgiven. Now when we die, we go to heaven. So what exactly does it mean to make the founder perfect through suffering? Because we know Jesus was without fault. He was perfect. There was no sin found in him. So to make the founder perfect through suffering, the word perfect, and I love this Greek word, is teleio in the Greek, and it's used to refer to a debt paid in full. So he paid the debt in full through suffering. He wasn't perfected. The suffering paid for us. I love that. So it also meant to complete a project or job, and it is a relative to the word Jesus used when he said it is finished or it is paid in full. And guys, he didn't just, it is finished. He yelled it at the top of his lungs. The debt has been paid in full. Then I commit my spirit to you. And he let go of his, his spirit. So uh, listen to what I found at Columba, Columbia International University. What makes this exclamation truly unique, however, is the Greek tense that Jesus used. Verb tenses are the most important and most communicative part of the Greek language. This also is sometimes necessarily lost in translation because we don't have those phrases. Jesus spoke in the perfect tense, which is very rare in the New Testament and has no English equivalent. The perfect tense is a combination of two Greek tenses, the present and aortist. The aortist tense is punctilar and meaning something that happens at a specific point in time, and the present tense is linear, meaning something that continues on into the future and has ongoing results. So let's say that we have this line, and we're going to call this line time. And so this is like the history of mankind, right? So when Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is paid in full. So that marks it. That marks that time. All right? So that's the, that's the aortist. He, he marks time. And then he uses the, the continuous tense to where it continues on into history from that point on. So it's kind of like when me and Mike married, there was a, a particular point. I uh, went from being a Wheeler before to a Wilson after, and I will continue to be a Wilson from that point forward, okay? So that's what that's talking about. When I had Kent, I became a mom. I will continue to be a mom. So what this means, get this, the combination of these two tenses in the perfect tense as used in John 19.30 is of overwhelming significance to the Christian. When Jesus said, it is finished, he was actually saying, it is finished and will continue to be finished. That's why he was crucified one time. See? So that marked it. He said it. It was legally recorded. So when we believe it is finished for us and it will continue to be finished. 
That's why religion is so dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's why saying you're still a sinner is so dangerous. That's why these crazy wackos that want to go back to the law and even sacrificing animals, okay, why that's so whacked. <laughs> because you are trampling the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why that's so dangerous. And that's why Paul said, I don't care if it's an angel from the Lord, if it's me, if someone preaches anything else, a gospel that is different from the one delivered, he is anathema. He is cursed with no possibility to be redeemed. That's crazy. That's crazy. So you have people that believe this nonsense for whatever reason, but those that are preaching it and those that are propagating it, they will go to hell. See, that's the thing. And so it's a very dangerous thing to touch what Jesus Christ has done. So Jesus Christ had to be morally perfect. All right? He couldn't sin one time. He had to live in absolute obedience to the Father. Any missing the mark for him would mean that he was no longer the spotless lamb. But if you think about it, the other idea is that his act of salvation would not be complete without his suffering because he had to take what was due us to satisfy the perfect justice of God. In other words, for us to truly be saved, he had to pay our penalty on our behalf, which is astonishing. So here we have, God said, okay, I got to be man to take back what man gave over. All right, okay, makes sense. But then he's like, However, because I'm God, I'm not satisfied with just that. I've got to not only take back what man gave away, I need to recreate man into my image, but in order to do that, I have to pay the penalty for their sin. So in Deuteronomy, he wrote, Curse is everyone who is on a tree. He literally wrote in the law the things that had to be satisfied to save us. That's why Paul said the law was to be a tutor, right? It wasn't for you to follow completely and perfectly. The law was to be a tutor. A tutor of what? Jesus Christ. But instead, the Pharisees took the law, and we talked about how they were formed last week. They took the law and they made it their God. So today, we've got people that have made church their God. People that have made worship their God. People that have made even the word their God, which is good. That's good. So we've got these things, these idols, they've made tithing a God, whatever it is. And wh why do I say that? Because by doing those things, they feel they are righteous. By doing those things, they feel that they're okay with God when the reality is you're righteous because of Jesus Christ. I, I am His righteousness apart from anything I do. You know, like someone last week, or maybe it was Friday, where it might have been Roberta where she's talking about that... Um, our strength is in the joy of the Lord. And she said, yeah, and she said, uh, our strength is in His joy. Of us. And it shifted. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, tilt, tilt, tilt. <laughs> I was like, His joy is our strength. Not our joy in Him. Right. His joy in us. It's a different thought. Yes. So it's the same thing here. We are righteous because of His righteousness and what He gave us. Okay, so we've got here Luke 13, 32, and then 24, 25 through 27. So let me read this. He said to them, go tell that fox. So he's talking about Herod. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Okay, he was God in the flesh. There was no perfection needed except for what? His body. Okay, so his body was going to be resurrected or complete because he's a pioneer of us. We will one day look like him. Then Luke 24, then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, all that they spoke. It was all in there, all of this. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses... And all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This is on the road to Emmaus. And do you guys know it wasn't until he broke the bread that they saw it was him? See, what that shows you is you can hear the word all day. 
You can listen to it. You can read it. You can teach it. You can tapes, whatever you want to listen to. But until the bread is broken, it becomes revelation. See, it means nothing. It doesn't bring about any transformation. I was talking to uh, a guy uh, yesterday about it. I said, I am not a proponent of the majority that is taught in churches. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, they teach you you're still sinners. They, they literally keep you in a sinful mindset. When Jesus Christ, it says in Hebrews, came, what did he come to do? To take away the consciousness of sin. He came away. He came to take it away. And yet most churches preach a consciousness of sin, not a consciousness of God. And I said, so, here's the reality. I am righteous apart from anything I do. Anything I do. I am righteous because He lives in me. And I told him, I said, most Christians live with a mental assent. I know God loves me. Really? Really? Do you? What comes out of your mouth when the pressure is applied? See? What comes out of your mouth when fear of not being able to pay your bills occurs? See, that's when you really know that He loves you. When you face those things and you're like, my God has already taken care of this bill. I'm not worried about it whatsoever. Now, don't, don't be in condemnation if you're not yet there because what needs to occur is a transformation in your thinking of a good daddy. That's what needs to occur. We've been raised by an abusive, negligent, absentee father, the devil. We get born again, and we have to relearn what it means to have a father, right? And if you had a good daddy, even if flawed, it helps. If you didn't have a good daddy, it can take a little bit longer. But the fact is, is when people say, well, I know God heals, or I know He loves me, or I know, I know, I know. I know they're a mental ascent. But the minute I start seeing faith, how do I see faith? It's now. It's present tense. There's no such thing as a future in faith. Yeah, He will heal me. Yeah, there's no such thing. I am healed. Right? So, faith is now. It's always now. In fact, He created our subconscious to only process now. So, whenever I hear people speaking future, or they put it off on the back burner, or they do whatever, while well, I'm believing for, they're not in faith. I was telling about my Chevelle. Because this man... I, I, I'm pretty sure he doesn't know the Lord. I said, my Chevelle, my 1970 Chevelle Super Sport 396, uh, <laughs> black with red, racing stripes that turned into flames. Anyway, fuzzy dice in the... <laughs> but, okay, so me and Mike, we're driving. Now, the back story is my dad had a, what did you decide it was, 67 GTO? Loved that car. Three deuces. Three, Tan interior. Black. He put a firebird on the hood. I'm not sure why. But anyway, I would play with his hair. I'd stay in the seat and play with his hair when we'd go for drives. I'd want him to do donuts. And uh, so he figured out that my stepmom was speeding up through yellow lights when we were driving one time and the light turned yellow. I'm like, go, Daddy, go. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, he's like, no, little, we got, you know. Oh, well, sissy doesn't do that. But anyway, and uh, he sold it in a drunken binge. When I was 13. And uh, man, I wanted that car. So anyway, me and Mike were dating, you know. And I almost, it was like uh, almost graduation. is before my birthday. It was in May of 1991. And it was at nighttime. And uh, were we on Avondale? Like we were on, in that area. And Mike sees the Chevelle sitting in the driveway. I'd never heard of a Chevelle. You know, I had tunnel vision. I was going to have that GTO. And uh, he sees the Chevelle. And he's like, oh. You might like that car. And it was for sale. I'm like, oh, I might like it. He's like, yeah. So we stop one in our car. We go for, you know, he drives it. And I'm like, oh, oh, this has some horsepower, you know. And so I was asking him questions. We, we tell my dad. And I knew that was my car, huh? I knew that was my car. We tell dad, oh, well, that's a little expensive, you know. They wanted 3800 So we went over to mom and dad's. And I said, we got my car. I have, you know, my car. It's been, you know, I got my car. And they get up to go outside to see my car. And I'm like, well, not yet. We'll be buying it. Because I had so much faith. That was the first gift of faith I ever had. It was for a hot rod. And uh, 
So then Mike, he goes back to the guy, and he, Mike, you know, good salesman, he starts, uh, or negotiator, he starts nitpicking. Well, we're going to have to do this, and the seat's torn, and we're going to have to put it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he, like, he starts just picking the whole thing apart. And the guy said, okay, I'll come down to three. And so we go to dad, and he says, you know, hey, he'll take three. Let's go get it. <laughs> you know, like, I was so excited. And so we went and got it. That was my car. It was not future. It was present tense. That's faith. So be careful in what is coming out of your mouth. If what comes out of your mouth is not present tense, you are not in faith. So you need to go back to the Word. You need to get that vision of what it looks like with your breakthrough, and that becomes more real to you than any present circumstance. So that's just a little mini faith lesson. And Jesus Christ had to do it Himself. He, he had to have faith that Holy Spirit would resurrect Him. So when He would say stuff like this, that... Uh, that he'd have to suffer these things and enter into his glory. And that on the third day, I will be perfected. He had to say these things to people and, and decree it himself. Why? Because the promise is in the decree. See? So that's why it's so important. It's not semantics. It's reality. What you say reveals your heart. Do you well, and I, think, I think also when he says those things, then we helps us understand that it's a process. We're going to have to do these things. We'll have to do, you know, he could have just said, oh yeah, I'm going to go translate into glory and not, and just skipped over the, first I got to suffer. Yeah. You know, all that, the, the tough stuff. Yeah. You know, and I think a lot of us just want to translate from, oh, let's learn a few things and then, yep, I'm going to be in glory then. Well, and didn't it say, for the joy set before him, Right. How did he maintain that? He had to see it. Right? Yeah. So he had to see the joy. That sustained him during the pain, during the mocking. But you know what? He won all of that in the garden. When the enemy was coming and he was trying to tempt him and get him out of there, he won it then. When he sweat great drops of blood, that's when he won it. So he won it in the garden, and then the rest was, you know, not to say a piece of cake, but just say that your battle is won in the place of prayer. When you leave that place full of faith, and don't ask for anything until you have faith first, when you leave from that place of uh, faith, everything that follows after is not what as difficult as it would be. You have to believe. Well, because there's an example even through that of, you know, what what's going on for us. Mm -hmm. That it's not just going to be that we're just going to believe and then there's a process. Yeah. Well, and there's then like you've got, uh, I, I'll never forget this answer. You know, President Trump operates in more revelation than your typical Christian. He said, they said, uh, do you think you're going to win last time? And he, he, it was so simple. He said, well, I wouldn't have ran if I didn't think I was going to win. You know, it's so practical. I wouldn't waste my money, nor my time, nor 